All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dear Dr. Fantasy. And for my very, very special guest today, I have sitting with me the author of the Broken Empire trilogy, the Red Queen's War trilogy, the Book of the Ancestor, the Impossible Times trilogy, the Book of the Ice, and the upcoming Library trilogy. It is the author, Mark Lawrence. Hello, Mark. How are you today? I know. I'm okay. Lovely to see you here. And I have been very excited about this discussion ever since you, I, I sort of twisted your arm and said, hey, you want to be on Dear Dr. Fantasy? <laughs> and this is uh, not a new thing for you, but it's been a while, I guess, since you've done a sort of a, a video interview type thing. Is that right? I think this is probably the first video interview I've done. I ah, okay. I've done a, a podcast or two in the past. Um, okay. But yeah, I think this is the first time I've been on camera in an interview. I did yesterday. I was um, guest of honor at my old university and, and uh, yeah, how'd that so go? a, a Q&A there, which I uh, took part in. So I guess that's kind of it. And it was okay. Um, I think I underwhelmed about the 12 students who turned up, but uh, <laughs> it was a uh, good practice, I suppose. Yes, yes. Well, that's that's good. And, you know, it doesn't matter how big the audience is as long as they're enjoying what uh, they're hearing. And uh, I, I'm very excited for this discussion. There's, uh, you are, I've made no secret of the fact that uh, you are among my very favorite authors. Uh, and I am a huge fan of fantasy, hence the nickname, Dr. Oh, yeah. Fantasy. <laughs> it's official, it's on the mug, right? We all have our themed mugs today, so. We do, yes, perfect, I love it. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I love your writing and it's it's very exciting for me to be able to talk to you uh, and uh, to hear a little bit about your writing journey and your reading journey and, and all kinds of stuff. And I have lots of questions for you, but let's start with the most important question. How is Wobble? Um, well, trouble. He's normally trouble. He, he demanded <laughs> to come into the office. Um, I can't leave him outside because I'll meow and scratch the carpet. But once he's in here. He has a fascination with the cable that is allowing us to speak without interruption. So there is a chance he'll start attacking it and then I'll have to break off and deal with him. <laughs> okay. Yes. And you have a dog as well. Do I have that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So a golden Labrador called Ruby. Ruby. Okay. And and I, Ruby... I wanted to give her a more imaginative name, but my wife compromised on Wobble. So I had ah. to compromise on, on Ruby. I was aiming for moon. <laughs> so you got to be awful. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I wanted her to be moon unit, but that wasn't going to fly. <laughs> moon unit. Okay. I like it. It would have flown as a moon unit, I suppose. But yeah. 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 I, I think names should embarrass you when you call them in the park. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And do they get on pretty well, Wobble and, and uh, Ruby? Um, well, I don't think Wobble has much time for her, but she seems to think that he is her friend and likes to follow him around and lick his face and basically oh. get get into his personal space. Okay. <laughs> the only place they have um, a sort of amnesty really is on the uh, the big cushion in front of the wood burner because they both want to be by the wood burner and they don't want to fight about it. So they just pretend that they're not there and put their backs together and, and that's uh, an accommodation of sorts. Yes. Okay. So they, they have a, a an understanding, I guess. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Well, I'm very excited. One of the things I do want to talk about is your upcoming um, first book in the library trilogy, which is the book that wouldn't burn. And I am so kind of, I'm going to show off a little bit because I do have one of the arcs out there uh, and it arrived unscorched. So I'm, I'm very happy to say, and here it is the book that wouldn't burn. And I am really thrilled that uh, I'm going to be reading this and giving my thoughts on it shortly before it's released. Now, the release is May something? 9th of May, I think, for America and the 11th for the UK. Oh, we get it first. Wow. Okay. Yeah, by two days. Wow. How about they're, that? They're normally um, slightly larger separation, but I, I pleaded with the um, the publishers to, to put them at the same time because otherwise yeah. you just try and have to hype up two different sets of people like four weeks apart oh my goodness yeah <laughs> you know, to sort of get that buzz going again four weeks yeah. later so. 
they got to rev up the engine all over again. Yeah, for that. Um, yeah, why why would they do it that way? Why why do they even separate them at, at all in the internet age? I I think it's just because publishing is fairly old fashioned, and they tend to think only in terms of their own market, and and they oh. don't really link up arms quite as well as they maybe could do. But um, okay. I think it's not like they're resistant to the idea. I just don't think it was um, front and center of their thinking. Okay. All right. Interesting. Yeah. There are all kinds of things I've learned about the publishing industry and sometimes they make me happy that I'm self-publishing. <laughs> so, but, but I do want to, if, well, I don't know what you can say at this point, cause it isn't coming out till May 9. Um, but anything you can say at all about, uh, I'm not going to press you with specific questions because sometimes I know authors cannot answer specific questions about their books that are not quite out yet. So what, what can you tell us at this point about the book that wouldn't burn? Well, I've always been terrible at elevator pictures. And I guess one of the reasons um, that I've sort of steered away from podcasts and YouTube mm -hmm. is simply because, um, and this is a terrible trait in an author that I don't so much like talking about my books. And, yeah. you know, that's kind of, you have to like talking about your books, otherwise, <laughs> what's the point? You're, you're not going to to sell them in that sense. Um, so and I'm happy to, in general, to, to talk about uh, all different aspects of fantasy and other people's books. But when it comes down to mine, I just sort of shy away from that. But oh. um, it's some, something that I have to overcome. And um, I was for this um best of honor thing yesterday i was um saying the difference between um a literary book and uh, a non-literary book so talking about literary fiction is if someone asks you what the book was about and you give them a sort of potted summary of events you know and this character did that and he has to go then that's not a literary book that's just a regular book which there's nothing wrong with um but if you were to answer what's it about and you say oh it's about bereavement or it's about growing old or something of that nature yeah. then that's a literary book yeah, and or you know, yeah, you could be projecting on something that isn't literary, and in the other case, you could be missing the the deeper themes of. But in general, that that's the difference. Um, and I I don't lay any particular claims to um, writing literary fantasy, but I do tend to have a theme or two lurking in there, and I am happy to more happy to talk about the themes of a book yes. because that they feel non spoilery to me. Um, I also was talking in, in this thing yesterday about um, twists because that was the theme of the, the conference was was twists. Yeah. Um, and I was saying how just telling someone that there is a twist in a book gives them a priori information that changes their relationship with the book. So even something as small as saying there's a twist in this book without saying what it is at all is a sense of a form of spoiler. And I wouldn't, for example, if if the uh, the book would, that wouldn't burn had a twist in or two twists, I wouldn't say because I don't want so but I will talk about the themes such as they are um yeah. so it concerns uh, an enormous possibly infinite library which is like the repository of all wisdom across the ages um and this has a, um, a fairly clear analogy in uh being a sort of stand-in for the internet and ah. The librarians that that uh, serve this this library are, in some senses, a search engine. So they have all the, the pros and cons of a search engine because if you have an infinity of information out there, then the way in which you choose what what to present to the public or the person who asks a question, there's a lot of power in that. Google has a lot of power, mm. uh, and if they wanted to abuse it, maybe they are, um, then they could, you know have quite an impact on the world so there are those themes going on and there's also the themes about um the difference between i guess um knowledge and wisdom so mm. in some senses if you are to place in the hands of people any uh information at all um that they ask for and it doesn't hold for the internet because the internet's limited to, basically to the stuff we know but this library has things in that the people outside don't know yet so there's a question um, if they ask, you know, how to build an atomic bomb, for example, do mm. you tell them? You know? And so it, there's an analogy there, like it's um, in some senses giving completely free access to information to people is like handing a toddler an open razor 
and just letting waiting for the bleeding to start you know so go go play with that you wanted it you said it was shiny um but on the flip side who gets to decide what you have what you can have access to right and so there's those themes are sort of running in the background you know there's lots of people running away from monsters or whatever and things exploding and blood and hissing but <laughs> the themes underneath all of that are, are, are the, the reason it's called the library trilogy is because it examines this idea of uh, information the difference between information and truth the difference between knowledge and wisdom Oh, wow. It sounds very timely. Uh, it sounds very relevant to the age that we find ourselves in. And uh, I'm very curious now uh, to give it a try. I, I also much prefer to talk about themes when I do my non-spoiler reviews and that sort of thing. And I find myself often when I talk about your books, um, and that would include the nine that I've read so far. I've only read nine out of the, oh, how many do you have out now? <laughs> 16? 16? 16? Okay. That's not including the short story collections and stuff too, though, is it? I think that includes Road Brothers. Which Road is Brothers. A... Okay. All right. So uh, I've read nine so far, and I will be reading all of them eventually. But I found some themes and some interesting uh, connections between these uh, trilogies uh, that I've read, which makes me think, okay, normally when you, you look at an author's work, you understand certain authors talk about immigration or certain, that's a, that's a favorite theme that they're, they're rolling over. Isn't that true? I think for most authors, you have a, we have a tendency to have our obsessions, our themes that we talk about a lot in our work. And sometimes I think it's even unconscious and it just sort of comes out. And other times it's very deliberate. And the author will say, yeah, I'm going to write a book about colonialism. And here, you know, and, and the story is going to be wrapped around that theme. And I don't know how you write. Do you ahead of time tend to say, ah, oh, these are the themes I'm going to do? Or do you start does the story just sort of emerge in you and you roll with the story and then you realize later, ah, these are the themes that I'm wrestling with here. Which do you tend to do? Yeah, no, I, I, the story will emerge along with the themes as I'm writing it. So okay. uh, I'm not in any way a planner. Um, I find yeah. that um, you made a video be a very that. useful thing yeah. to do, but, but it kind of sucks the joy out for me. So um, yeah. I don't. I didn't decide that this book was about the things I just told you, um, but I did want to write a book about a big, infinite library, and I guess wrapped up in that would be uh, the things that I ended up addressing. Interesting, because I do feel like you're an author. So you don't plan them, but I I do feel like you're an author who's at least in the the nine books I've read, there are certain themes that you do come back to. One is friendship. I think um, when I read, particularly. I would say Red Queen's War, it was very evident in there, but also very much it was central to Book of the Ancestor, the theme of friendship. And, and again, I guess that was something, it just happened as you were writing the story, probably, but found family, friendship, that sort of thing. Uh, I thought they were yeah. some beautiful statements uh, about those things. There are obviously things that that interest me and they tend to come out in, in my writing. I think even yeah. Broken Empire was about friendship in as much it was a glaring absence and, yeah. and George yeah. obviously had um, great issues with the uh, the power that being friends with someone then gave them over him and because of his nature right. he Vulnerability. Didn't want that to happen. So, so he battled against friendship all the time uh, even though sometimes it sort of slipped in underneath his armour um, and I think Nona um, demonstrated those those levers that that Jorg was was afraid of allowing other people to have she just handed them out and then suffered the consequences of them afterwards yeah 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 because the flip side i suppose of opening yourself up to friendship is vulnerability isn't it and that's something jorg would be very aware of <laughs> i would say th- i would say um but or even jalan you know um he's somebody who's a bit wary but uh had eventually uh, I think it's fair to say, been deeply affected by 
the friendship with Snorri. Not to give anything away there, but you know, I think it's it's a central part of that book and one that I find very endearing. Uh, one of the reasons I love that trilogy. Uh, yeah, I think with um, the the Red Queen's War, there was a theme there of how the story you're wrapped up in affects you, and how stories can can take control of us, and the stories that we tell about ourselves are, in essence, ourselves. Yeah. And because yeah. uh, Jalan had a particular story that he told himself about himself, mm. and by because he's narrating, he was telling us all of the time that the exceptions to that that he allowed in had to be wrapped up in a story of their, their own so that he would um, not openly admit that he was contradicting anything that he'd already established. Um, so he would he would never say, um, you know, Snorri is my friend, I'll die for him or whatever. He would have some ridiculous excuse for why he went and put himself in grave danger in order to to help Snorri on occasions. I agree. And that leads me to another, uh, I think, motif that I find in your work, which is the unreliable narrator and something that you use to great effect. And I think that somebody who reads Broken Empire or Red Queen's War and doesn't realize that the narrator is unreliable, the first person narrator is going to miss a lot. There are a lot of subtle clues about what's really going on with these characters. And you have to, you have to I think, go in realizing, oh, I should be a little skeptical of Jorg and Jalen sometimes, shouldn't I? Um, and, and I think that's a, it's, it's something that you use to really great effect, the idea of the unreliable narrator. I think really um, most or many people, reasonably complex people are unreliable narrators, even if they don't mm. realize it themselves, that you and I are probably unreliable narrators to ourselves about our own lives. We have parts of it we describe in certain terms and have done so for uh, long enough for it to become fossilized in our thinking Yeah, that probably aren't accurate representations of the past. And I think when I talk about unreliable narrators or use them it's really as a sort of a, a, a part of the thing i really like talking about which is truth and lies uh -huh. um, and memory um and yeah. all of those things are wrapped up and the unreliable narrator narrator just sort of falls out of examinations of truth and lies and memory um huh. but yes they, they, they can be fun yeah i mean of course memory is as you know, you have a science background, <laughs> although you're not a neurologist, I think, right? I'm not a neurologist, no. But you, I'm sure you know enough, uh, and memory is uh, notoriously, we don't even know really know what memory or consciousness are, actually, but it's fascinating to think about how we are, we rely on our identities, you know, in, in terms of our memories, our memories inform our identities. And here we, memories are these really unreliable things that we're constantly tweaking. I also find that fascinating. I think it's, it's, uh, when you think about it, um, our, our narratives, our, our self narratives are, as you said, unreliable. Not that we're, I mean, sometimes maybe we are deluding ourselves um, and sort of semi aware of it, I guess. I think it's fascinating and also a bit scary that the uh, the sort of bedrock of who each of us is is not only potentially not founded in truth, but also not constant, and we're not aware of it shifting, and we're not aware of it being incorrect. It's very, it's not very rocky bedrock, is it? <laughs> it's bed rubble. It's like air almost. Yeah, uh, it is. It is terrifying and fascinating at the same time. And uh, there might even be a sort of a spiritual element uh, to that, I suppose. Uh, but um, And that's something you get into a bit, I think, in, in one of the reasons I loved Book of the Ancestor, which every time I read one of your trilogies, I, I, I love it even more than the previous one. So Book of the Ancestor is currently my favorite um, and when I progress, who knows what's going to happen, but I really love the spiritual elements that you brought in there um, with the various types of magic, um, but also the, and, and there's sort of sciency at the same time. Like one thing you do, again, as an author, you seem to be very willing and adept at combining science elements and which tend to be more like 
fact, I guess, driven and but also more spiritual, magic y fantasy elements and, and bringing all that together. Is that just something that you, again, that just comes naturally to you? Well, I guess uh, I think fantasy is my first love. Um, huh. And science, science is something I've been doing for a long time. So, yeah, uh, essentially second nature. Um, so it just seems a fairly natural thing to uh, draw upon both of them when, when I write stuff. Um, you know, what have you got to draw upon, especially if you're too lazy to do much research, which I am, um, when you write a book <laughs> apart from what you have, you know, internally. So yeah. uh, I draw on my sort of love of fantasy, which is sort of heart and soul and mysticism. But I also inject some uh, so some of the rationality of, of, of science, you know, yeah. have a structure, show me the evidence type stuff. Yeah, it, it works. It works really well. And you actually had a job as a scientist. You were a, a like probably a, a really nice job, very stable, high paying. And then you just said, let me be a writer <laughs> instead. That That's interesting, right? You must love well, writing. It's it's not quite as um, straightforward as that, I guess. I, uh -huh. I was a a, re a research scientist for twenty years, um, okay. and in the UK, that is not a well paid job. You know, uh, you, yeah, it, it surprises people. People think that research scientist, you got your PhD and you're going and you're bashing atoms together or whatever it happens to be, um, <laughs> and they they think that you are rich. And, and actually, I think uh, a London bus driver probably earned more than I do. Wow. did as, as a scientist in the uk when i when i moved to the states then i tripled my salary overnight yeah and if i were to move to to europe i would have doubled it so it's it's more of a historical thing i think in the uk uh ah. science was seen as a sort of a vocation it was a class thing and, wow and so i don't know maybe that they thought scientists didn't need the money because they're all rich boys who decided to um you know uh, do a bit of alchemy in their spare time but the fact is that UK scientists are very badly paid. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you, you, it, it's the birthplace of industrialism and all that. And it's it's kind of <laughs> and a lot of scientific breakthroughs and, you know, Darwin and all kinds of. But then it doesn't uh, make sense to me. But um, I guess they feel that the, the sorts of people who make good scientists, well, they, the mechanics of it are they can afford, they can pay those salaries and people come and do it anyway, so why should they pay more? And I guess the reason that people come and do those things is because, like me, they would have been very bored in any other job. Um, mm. you know, I could have gone and worked in the, the City of London and, and done something financial and, and earned five times my salary, but I would have been bored mindless, so... Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. You... Uh, um, Oh, and we're having a bit of a lag there. You'll probably catch up. Okay, I'm, I'm still talking. Yep, okay, you're good. Yep, we just had a little lag there. Uh, did you finish your thought? I'm sure I can skillfully edit that way. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting. I think it has a lot to do with the peculiar history of the United Kingdom and... I read it during the course of my dissertation research, I wrote in my dissertation on William Morris um, and his translations of Icelandic sagas and his Beowulf translation. I also have a chapter on his, what they call prose romances, which are essentially fantasy, which were very, very influential for Tolkien. Tolkien essentially wanted to do what William Morris did. And a lot of people think, well, Tolkien invented fantasy, but now actually... Um, he had his influences and William Morris was doing something similar. And so anyway, in the course of the, my research, I was doing a lot about 19th century medievalism, which was very much a reaction against industrialism, against capitalism. And you had this peculiar British thing going on in the 19th century where you have these kind of mostly reactionary people who didn't like industrialism and capitalism want to go back to the old beautiful feudal ways right and <laughs> so very much idealized um on their part um but it, it resulted in ultimately a kind of british rejection of it's like the, the dirty business of making money you know that sort of thing so while the uk had a head start in industrialization and capitalism it's a, it's a head start that they kind of gave up on in a way because of this ideal of of that 
money making thing being a dirty thing and and I, I suspect something similar is behind the the historical uh low pay for scientists perhaps i think you can see it in um lord of the rings that there's a clear rejection of yeah. industrialization as a thing you know that it's the the way the orcs have their uh their swords mass produced and yeah. the elves are sort of all handcrafted actually in the um in the film and the uh the series it's the elvish stuff that looks uh, mass produced because it's beautiful but they only did one helmet for the elves and then they oh, yeah. for cgi purposes they reproduced it a million times which seems to be the opposite <laughs> yeah. of, of uh, the elven uh, aesthetic but uh, yes i think lord of the rings was was anti-industrial um there's a, a slum using to me at least um illustration of the difference in um uh, pay and perks when i did my last year in the states um and at the end of the year i got a, a bonus and the bonus uh the cash bonus it was an equivalent of a kilogram of gold um and when i came back to the uk at the end of my first year there they gave me a sort of christmas bonus and it was a kilogram of biscuits so i had a tin <laughs> of biscuits weighing one kg and, and that was my my bonus for the year <laughs> oh dear <laughs> uh, i think that sort of sums up the difference between the, the two countries and and the, the the way scientists are treated in them so well yeah. Anyway, so I came back and I worked as a scientist for some more time. I've always and I was always been writing in my spare time. Um, and when I got the the book deal, um, I didn't give up my my day job. I uh -huh. stuck at it. I, I'd written about five, six books um, after that, and um, they they just closed down the entire advanced research uh, center. So like 150 PhD scientists were made redundant. Wow. Um, and that's why I went full time. Um, I had been thinking of it because I was, you know, uh, earning a lot more as, a, as an author at that point than I was as, as a scientist. Wow. Um, but uh, I sort of shied away from it because the, um, the, the writing career is a very um, unsafe one. It can sort of tank overnight, essentially. Uh, and so I, I, and I like doing the science. Um, but in the end, you know, they, they made me redundant and I was happy to take the redundancy pay that I would have missed out on if I'd re resigned uh, a year before as I was considering. So, Wow. Wow. Huh. That's fascinating. I mean, that is surprising, I'm sure, to an American audience to hear. Uh, and the, 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 the disparity there is, wow. OK. And that's still the case today for uh, UK scientists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Huh. These things do not change rapidly, so. So another thing you could possibly earn money from is your YouTube channel. Uh, <laughs> so you, are you monetized? Are you monetized yet? No, no. Okay. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, it's not, it's the, the point of it is, is to um, have another way of contacting readers. And uh, it's, I feel if it were monetized, A, I'd probably make about $2 a month off it. But also, um, it would get in the way. You know, pe I, people are always looking for an excuse to turn away from something, and if they find themselves staring at adverts instead of the thing they clicked on, then they may just sort of click away. I'd rather they heard what I had to say than earned me a cent. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's about a, a cent or a fraction, a, a, a half penny, a hay penny, as it were. <laughs> yeah, probably is what you'd get. But but it is interesting that you started a channel, and I think personally that. In general, the publishing industry is, uh, with the exception of certain authors who are doing it on their own, I feel like the publishing industry is a little behind when it comes to awareness of this platform. I think that YouTube has, I hear a lot about book talk, which is apparently what they call it when you talk about books on TikTok. Um, and I hear, um, Twitter gets some attention, but it, it seems like YouTube or BookTube, as they call it, doesn't get nearly enough. And you do have a few authors like Brandon Sanderson who has his own channel. And I know a few others who do have channels, um, but it seems like there's a lot of potential here that isn't quite being used uh, to the, the extent that it could be. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think, as I said at the start, that um, publishers, publishing is, is a very old fashioned industry and it can be yeah. quite slow to adapt to things um and you know often you need a reason to adapt so you know if things are going okay you carry on doing them um and so i i think 
that they are slow to look at new platforms. Um, when I was published in Brazil um, by Darkside, they had, um, I think it was an Instagram uh, channel and, and maybe a Twitter one, and those all had like hundreds of thousands of followers, and they put an awful lot of effort into putting interesting graphics and amusing memes and all of this stuff. And they had a, a huge social media um, footprint that they were a small publisher. And I'm guessing here randomly, but I sort of my impression is sort of 10% of the size of, of my UK and American ones. Uh, but their impact online was vastly outweighing um, those ones. Um, Interesting. Because, you know, I guess they were just trying to carve out a new place in an emerging market as opposed to. Uh, uh, publishing which has rather few sort of um startups I, I guess yeah interesting wow and i by the way i love what you're doing i'm gonna do a little shout out for your channel here because i love what you do there there are very few people as much as booktube is is fairly popular and there are channels that have hundreds of thousands of subscribers and all of that there are very few people who do what you're doing which is close reading you know, analysis, looking at, um, you know, and you give us news and stuff as well, which we love. Uh, but I, I'm here, I, I'm here for the book discussions and the more close up analysis type stuff. I really love that. I know it's not, <laughs> not uh, the most popular thing on, on the platform, but for people who want to learn how to write, which is actually a lot of people, a lot of people, like I would guess that the more than half of the people who have a booktube channel have a book in their drawer or on their hard drive or whatever or want to write and so i think the vast majority of us are very interested in content that is about writing and how to you know learn the craft and that sort of thing so uh, i think it's great uh, there's a place for that here yeah i i i mean i started the, the channel so i could uh, become more at ease on camera and uh -huh. build up slowly to the sort of interactions we're, we're having now because i i certainly have and had uh anxieties about all forms of communication that, that aren't essentially face-to-face -face or text i i call up my best friend on the phone at his insistence about once every five years um <laughs> Uh, and you know it's almost impossible to get me to to call people you know there has to be a really good reason it's never going to be spontaneous that's just not who I am right um so I, I did these YouTube things as this practice and uh they're essentially low energy rambles I am not uh-huh and if and in, I'm not a person who who uh externalizes enthusiasm in in a convincing manner um and I I don't suffer from an excess of personality uh, and these things uh, are often very useful in, in a medium like this that because I, the people I enjoy watching have very strong dynamic personalities uh -huh. and high energy and, and they entertain me and I know that I, I can't do those things so I play to whatever strengths I have which are, are typically writing um, and I am hampered somewhat in that because um, many of the people who are successful at giving writing advice either believe or have decided to pretend that there is a one way of doing things there is a correct way of writing and that they will have this sort of yeah. 10 point plan for you you yeah. do it like this 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 and, and you will succeed and that's very saleable because people want there to be um, a right way of doing things uh, and my my truth is is that there are um there's no right way and there are no wrong ways and so that's not a very compelling message in terms of uh, <laughs> i want you to tell me how to write good books tune in and this guy's saying there's no right so so i go and you would go and move to someone who is saying this is the right way and, and i'll lay it out for you uh, and rather than spend my time saying that too often instead i just concentrate well in these series of what page one critiques i i concentrate on the actual writing and i say these points i think are, are working and these points aren't uh for me and then it's very clearly an opinion i'm not telling anyone it's it's right or wrong i'm just giving my reaction to it and saying how i would do it and mm -hmm. i think that's a nice format um for me to sort of give writing advice through a critique 
I think it's wonderful. I love those one uh, first page critiques. Uh, I, I'm always trying to learn how to get better as a writer. And I, I see every time I sit down, that's the challenge. How can I make this better? How can I make this better? Um, so I, I, I just eat that stuff up. You have other content there too. Like one video I really enjoyed was when you explained your writing journey um, and how you started out. So you've always really been a writer uh, of a sort, uh, whether, you know, back back in the day when you were doing those. Now, you have to explain this one to me uh, and, and uh, remind me what it was called, but you had these essentially these mail away, uh, like sort of D&D &D type things where you were the, you were writing these, uh, um, I guess they were gaming, but it was through the mail or <laughs> how did that work? <laughs> Pre-internet, obviously. I mean, you're, you're clearly younger than me, but you're probably old enough if, had you been interested to to have been um, a conscious human being at the time this was happening uh, before the internet, uh, yeah. people. Oh, I'm, I'm to, not that much younger than you are, so <laughs> yeah. People who wanted to to have a sort of fantasy role playing experience other than over the tabletop with with friends um, would play this thing called play by mail, which was. Um, in the case of the, the game I ran with a whole bunch of other people, I think there were sort of six or eight of us at the maximum, um, a big shared world that was like a DD and d campaign in, in as much as it had cities and tombs and rivers and, you know, politics. Um, and hundred, well, there's about a thousand people, I guess, at the, the height of it would be wow. running, running characters in this world. And those characters would have statistics and they would uh, allocate points and they would build these characters up in a sort of, D, D style they would get better at what they do but yeah. their turns would just be entirely text turns they would say you know uh, they would obviously be based on the turn they just read had but they would say you know, and now i will i will battle this ogre and then after he if he if i manage to kill him i'll go and explore the caves behind him and i'll be sure to sort of take a torch for some like and you know you give information and you know if we don't find anything in there then we'll come out and we'll explore up the river and yada yada you know and wow i will I will behave like this with this this character I'm adventuring with and I will watch out for that. And and I would look at that and I would write them essentially a story back that advanced the thing, you know, in the world that they were in. And sometimes they would meet other characters who were played by real people. Sometimes it would just be entirely populated by my imagination based on the, you know, the template of the map and the religions and the magic system that was set in place. That's wild. Um, huh. People played hundreds of turns in this thing, and uh, you know we would have little get-togethers um, for face-to-faces where some small percentage of the uh, the population would would turn up and take part in these. And I ran it in my spare time for a long time. It was uh, good wow. fun. Wow! So you were essentially a, a, a dungeon master, yeah. But in it with correspondence, I guess. Yeah. So I would have to write dialogue and description, and you know try and make the battle sound exciting. So it was all good writing practice. That's good. Pre that's good training. Yeah, that's amazing. And yeah, so, and you these, have to, you have yeah, to go get ahead. the excitement into one or two pages. So you know, you you're yeah. forced not to ramble too much because otherwise, what have they got to react to? Yeah, I think training as a short story writer is is in a similar way a really good exercise because it does make you more efficient. Um, that's really awesome. Uh, and and you do to me actually. You you have this really wonderful balance of somebody who writes books that are entertaining, but at the same time, they make me think. Like we talked about some of those themes uh, earlier and I, I'm, I'm thinking about your book long after I've finished it. That to me is the sign of a, a book that is a bit literary, I have to say, uh, as well uh, as entertaining and fun. And that's, that's kind of the sweet spot, I think. Um, but, but that's brilliant. So a thousand people and so did you have, so if somebody wrote in with their little bit, I, this is what I do, I kill the ogre or whatever, I attack the ogre. Were there other people who they may not even know who are sending in their little bits? Did you ever have them meet each other during these campaigns? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, sometimes there would be you know, a city under siege and characters would flock to it. So you'd have people on oh, the walls wow. defending it. You'd have people talking to the the, the king of the, the city, trying to organize things on a higher level. You'd have people in the ranks of the army sieging, besieging the walls. Um, you know, you'd have all these different points of view on the same events. That and is it was wild. nice. It was nice to engineer moments between characters. And sometimes they would fight each other to the death. I mean, in many ways, it's it's a sort of 
forerunner of things like World of Warcraft, etc. Yeah. Online, except it had a lot more obviously individual character and heart and soul to it because it wasn't just like the same scenario played by hundreds of people across the world. It was yeah. handcrafted to to those those needs. It's very labor intensive, so it's never. It sounds it. It sounds like it took a lot of time. Yeah. Wow, that is so cool. So my my friend uh, A. P. Canavan, who has a channel, a Critical Dragon, wrote his PhD dissertation. He has a PhD in fantasy, and he wrote his dissertation on the impact of role playing games on the genre. And his contention is that essentially role playing games have had just as much of a, a an influence as something like Tolkien. You know, and it's 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 often unacknowledged this influence that role playing games has had on the genre, but there are certain things like if you look at the quest group, for example, right? And in, in typical fantasy, it has a lot more in common with Dungeons and Dragons than it does with, you know, Tolkien's, you know, you've got the the nine uh, companions who four of them are essentially baggage. That's the hobbits, right? <laughs> and then you've got a wizard who has like a nightlight on the end of his staff. And that's kind of the extent of his wizardry. You know, he doesn't do a lot of actual like magic. Uh, you've got you got a couple good fighters there, right? And you've got one, you know, archer and, and uh, an axeman. So, I mean, uh, the quest groups of modern fantasy have much more in common with D&D &D than that. Uh, so that's one example, I guess, of, of where you see um gaming influencing the genre would would you say that your writing is influenced by gaming in that way or is that something you've ever thought about well um i can't say that it's not because uh D D has certainly been a large part of my early life um i went to school um and the first uk games workshop opened immediately opposite my school like 100 yards away oh so lucky in, you wow in, in 1977 so um how much of my school life was spent nipping out to this shop chatting there getting the, the magazines and the the figures yeah. uh, and coming back you know and then they started bringing out all of the different D, &D stuff uh, and playing it in lunch breaks in, in school and then with my friends uh, at home I haven't played for for a long time. I did play with my kids, um, play D&D &D with them um, when they were, I guess, sort of 10, 11, 12 for a few years. Um, so, yes, obviously it sparked my imagination and um, I guess a number of ideas may have been tried out there. But I, I don't um, think I don't think D&D &D adventures make good stories because uh -huh. they they are born in the moment um to serve the purpose of continually entertaining the people who are, are doing them um right but they're not structured in the same way stories are structured so it, it's like um almost like when people come and they tell you about their dreams that rapidly becomes boring because dreams are not good <laughs> stories <true. laughs> they're, they're, yeah. they're better experienced from the inside and then you shut up about them and i think D, &D is the same uh i i have a good friend who back in the day would and he would play with different groups. And then he'd come and he'd try and tell me about the adventure he'd had with those. And it was so dull to listen to. Um, <laughs> and I, 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 you know, I, I still, he's still my friend and, and I, I, I have a high opinion of him, but I don't yeah. want him to tell me the, the stories. And for that you reason, I don't You should have said, listen, let, let me tell you about my dream I had last night. <laughs> <laughs> I should have, yes. <laughs> but, but for that reason, I don't put dream, my dreams or my D&D &D, campaigns into a book guy I, I think i just take the imagination uh that that created those things and aim it at the page and try and deliver it in a different format no yeah, interesting wow i, I mean it, it, i think like you said though it, that must have been a wonderful way to uh hone your your craft and uh i'm sure that that was something you know a, a, one of uh, many things that uh, were, I guess, catalysts for your writing eventually, but uh, it's it's really neat. Uh, and uh, one other thing I really wanted to talk about too, uh, while I have you here today, um, is the uh, SPFBO. Uh, and it, we're at a, a fairly exciting stage of that right now, I think. It's all exciting. It's all exciting, all from, from start to finish, but uh, we're getting toward you know, we're getting down to the wire here. We had the 10 finalists 
and you're beginning to see some results, I think, from the uh, the judges uh, on yes. these 10 finalists. So you're some front runners are emerging among the 10. I think it's fair to say is that that's kind of where we are now, right? Yes, yeah, so I think we've got about um, six weeks left to go. And the there's a, a scoreboard. So 10 finalists have 10, score, have 10 scores each from the 10 bloggers. So 100 scores to fill in in this this table. And uh, wow. we've, pa- we've passed the halfway point. So I think we've so we've got in the sort of 55 to 60 range of the, the scores. So we, they're all in books and are ranked on their current average. And that can shift around a lot. But uh, there's some, some pretty high scoring books there. I think the top four of them all have scores that could have won the contest overall in past years. Wow. Yeah. So uh, I think the judges are thinking that uh, there's some very good, good reads among them. Seems like it. Now, for anyone who doesn't know, I should have probably started with this, but the SPFBO or SPFBO, as some people call it, um, this is something that you started and uh, it is called the Self-Published Fantasy uh, Blog Off. Is that what it stands for? That's right. Yep. Okay. I got it right. (laughs) Okay. Uh, And tell us about it because I think it's wonderful and I think more and more people are, are hearing about it and, and know what it is, but I, it's growing, isn't it as well? It's something that you started and it seems like every year it's getting bigger uh, and it's a wonderful thing too, but, but tell us what it is and, and why you did it, if you don't mind. Um, well, I first to just quickly address the idea that it's growing. Um, I think the only metric by which we can tell it's growing it, because it's a fixed nature you we have 300 books come in each year um, yeah. and they are uh, judged um and the way in which we know the interest levels are ramping up is that the 300 come in progressively quicker and quicker uh-huh. so we this is the eighth year uh, in the first year i think we only managed to get 276 and then every year since then we managed to get 300 but i think in the second year it may have taken us three or four days to accumulate the 300 and i think last year it took about five or six hours wow so, Wow. Um, that that's the measure by which I can tell that uh, that's a statement. It, it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's a contest and I started it for uh, I guess a variety of reasons. Um actually one of the reasons I um keep changing the nature of the books I write. So you could, I can imagine I write a, a 10 series book, um 10 book series. Uh, and I've never done that because I, I get bored very rapidly and, and I sort of want to, to change what I'm writing about. So three three books is merely my limit. And I have been asked about uh, Spiffbo um, so many times that I'm getting a bit bored about giving the answer. I really start, should start making up sort of alternate you know, sort of origin <laughs> stories for it. Like, uh, you know, sort of a, a witch threatened to curse me unless I, unless I did it. Uh, I want to be in the position like um, what the Heath Ledger's Joker, where he's always giving a different story about how he got his scars. Yeah, to, yeah. To just every time I do an interview, to to uh, give a different background story. Or I'm Iago, get... why he hates Othello, right? You know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm starting to get bored of my own voice when it comes to saying how how I got Spiffo, but um, to be fair, it's it's a it's a, a question that interests people out there, and and because Spiffo exists for the benefit of the people the self-published authors who take part in it um it's it's very good that you have asked thank you because uh-huh. it gives the opportunity to to um to make it serve its purpose so it's um in order obviously to to focus more attention on self-published fantasy and i guess the um the reason i did it is um well, partly because I just get bored and I like inventing things and, and contests have always interested me. But uh, it's partly survivor guilt that I have always felt that there was a large uh, bucket of luck involved in, in my books doing well and my career having taken the path it's taken. And I have seen other people um, struggle against enormous odds and and fail. Yeah. Um, and so I, I, I felt guilty, survivor guilt, and I, I wanted to sort of offer another chance to self-published um, authors and I feel that not only does it um, do good to the people who, who who win the contest because they get more eyes on, on their particular book um, but it also acts as a way of um, giving the reading public more confidence when choosing a self-published book because that always used to be a problem that people reported that there was an awful lot of these books on on display 
and really no way of choosing which one would be a good read because um, the bloggers typically in the sort of 10, 10 years ago weren't reviewing them. And so, and they all would have sort of a, a very small handful of sort of blurring reviews, which you could imagine might be from friends and family. And so people would sort of pick one at random and sometimes they'd have a very bad experience and, and not go back again. Right. Whereas having exposed them to these uh, to this process meant that there were here a set of 10 and then all the semi-finals behind that um, who have had and now basically all of the books, almost all of the books that enter will get a review. Um, so it's a, a sort of form of quality control that the potential reader can come along and they can say, I'd like to try a self-published book. Mm. Fancy book. And one of these would be a good place to start. And they could they're sort of not guaranteed a good experience, but they have a greater statistical expectation of a good experience. And then hopefully that will let, let them go on and, and see uh, more of those books. Um, and yes, it's, it's not a perfect system by any means. Uh, there's, it's, it, I describe it as a net. So it's a safety net which catch something, but it's got big holes and as all nets do and, and books still fall through. So there's plenty of excellent books, I'm sure, that, that fall at the first hurdle. In fact, you know, 97 point something percent of all the entries fall at the first hurdle. Right. And I'm sure there's some some great books in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. It has produced some excellent, excellent uh, reads. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, it's it's actually, I think, not a very controversial thing to say that this is the best era ever for self-publishing. And Spiffo is a part of that picture, I think. And you've got the ability, like here on this platform, to market books and like never before. You have social media. You have so there's a lot of things that are leveling the playing field, so to speak. And certainly I think there has, I, I feel like we are in the midst of a shift in perception of self-publishing, that it is becoming, uh, a lot of people just won't even distinguish between a self-published book and a traditionally published book at this point. They don't care where it came from, which wasn't the case, I think, not so long ago. And there are some caveats, of course, to that. I mean, you do, as a self-published author, I think it, it's very much in your interest to you have to do on your own what the publisher would do for you so you have to hire an editor you know and that is not cheap you should hire a decent artist for the cover because you want your cover to be eye catching you know you, there's a lot of expense uh they estimate uh, that one self published book costs the author about 5 to 10,000 dollars to put out which is accurate i can say <laughs> so uh yeah i mean it's not it's not easy and it's not cheap it's a lot a lot of work but if you're willing to put on all these hats and and be you know take care of those things that the traditional publisher would have done and you're willing to put in all that work and all that time and, and also be the marketer and, you know, get out the hustle on social media and all of that. I, I, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty much uh, you, you, you have a chance like never before. Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, yes, it's, um, it's harder as a self-published author to sell books. Right. Um, but as a traditionally published author, it's hard to get to the position to be a traditionally published author. Whereas a self-published author, no one's stopping you apart from, you know, what, the expenses you mentioned. And even those, right. whilst they shouldn't be optional, they are optional because you could, if you wanted, not have an editor pray on your own image, front page and, and put it out there. Um, so, uh, and I think the reward for the harder path that you have chosen is that if you succeed, mm. you will get to keep a vastly greater portion of the money from each sale. Right. Because I, you know, a publisher took a large financial gamble on my work. And so they keep the lion's share of any sale. Um, and that's fine. You know, that's, they right. deserve it because right. they gave me a bucket of money to start with and <laughs> put, did a lot of the work in, in putting it out there. Right. Um, though even self, though even traditionally published authors these days, there is a, a great expectation that they will get out there on social media, like I'm doing here, and essentially publicise themselves. That uh, so self-published authors and traditionally published authors these days tend to find themselves in, in the same um, position on that front. 
Yeah. 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 It's, it's an interesting time. Uh, I think there's a lot bit of a chaos in, in the publishing world to some degree. We've seen a lot of resignations among uh, editors and that sort of thing. COVID was obviously a, a uh, another uh, element that added more chaos to the chaos, I think. And so it, and with the internet, of course, really started a lot of this too. I think the, the idea that, um, a lot of uh, even I, I suppose now uh, many authors are not going to go back to doing book tours. They're going to do social media, right? I mean, I think my impression is that book tours came to a screeching halt during COVID. A lot of stuff came online, and people realized, oh, well, you know, we could just keep doing a lot of this online now. It's, it's easier. Yeah, I think the, the technology has certainly reached a point where it, these sorts of interactions for for people who are just doing regular jobs, a lot of them are now doing them remotely. Um, and yeah. The, the conference I remotely was guest of honor, a guest of honor at yesterday, you know, it's functioned very well uh, and there were no real issues. So um, I book tours, fantastically expensive, you know, the, how many books do you need to set extra books do you need to sell in order to finance the travel and the, you know, the organization, it, it's pretty big. So I, I think unless you are, you know, some sort of mega star, um, you know, Neil Gaiman or something that you really, there, there isn't financial sense to it and the only reason to do it is because you like going out and talking to people or yeah. going to conferences and, and doing these things and you know I go to my local conference um, convention Bristol Con um, every yep. year I have a great deal of fun there so I can I, you know, I can't travel to the others because of personal circumstances with my daughter but yeah I can certainly see that the uh, the whole being out there and meeting other authors uh has a great deal of attraction to it which may may um reinvigorate the idea of book tours and, and certainly going on the convention circuit just because it's fun and, and writing is a, is a lonely business but um yeah and i mean i imagine you've uh you was talking about putting all these different hats on and i imagine you've been putting hats on and taking them off uh, at great speed recently i have i have and sometimes it's like we're your glasses are, where'd I put my glasses? You know, it's like, which hat am I wearing right now? <laughs> so yes, I have been wearing a lot of hats. And the good thing is I love this. I love uh, fantasy. I love literature. So my day job is I'm an English professor and I teach literature. I do this because I am passionate about it and I love fantasy. And yeah, I'm about to become a, an author. Uh, so it's uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun for me, but yeah, it is is also an intense amount of work. Um, and in my case, it uh, is uh, about 18 years. I'm, I'm sort of the opposite of you in this sense because <laughs> I, I mean, I you, you you talked about you being more of a gardener, you know that that approach to writing, and I'm definitely much more of a, a planner or architect or whatever you want to call it, and. So I, I wrote, of course, I had this idea when I was, I read Lord of the Rings when I was a kid, when I was probably 12 or 13 years old. And, and I thought to myself, that's what I want to do. I want to write something like this. I want to do this to people, you know? So I, uh, I took the scenic route to being a, a fantasy writer. I thought, because Tolkien did it this way, I have to go learn old English and old Norse and I have to uh, world build the heck out of this before before I, I start writing a story. And I did all that. And then I realized, oh, you know what? I actually need to learn how to write a story, don't I? <laughs> so that that part in my case, so, uh, yeah. My, my mother read me Lord of the Rings when I was seven years old. Oh, and, wow. Um, my reaction was not to say I, I wanted to go and write that, but I wanted to sort of live in it, which I guess is where the playing D and D at an early age came in because yeah. I was eleven when I first discovered D and D, and and that was the opportunity to essentially don the helmet and dive into you know Lord of the Rings type situation, um, and and yeah, the writing came a lot later for me, but huh. um, I should forewarn you that. Um, when you do all this work to launch a book and you've got the growing excitement um, that builds up towards the actual release and you know you, the first having your hard copies and the first reviews that the actual launch day excitement the day after there's this anti-climax and you're sort of just them waiting and you're sort of is this it you know and and 
there's nothing immediate you know because people take time to read a book and uh, so that that's that's one of my experiences with with the, the first book that uh, and every other book afterwards yeah that there's it's this um yeah the, 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 you put all this work in and you get the thing out you got it out you push the buttons it's all happened and then what now and what now is you write the next one i guess yeah yeah i i, I am i'm somewhat accustomed to anti-climax <laughs> in, in my life uh you know when i finished my dissertation i mentioned it earlier you would think that at the end of that you defend the thing and, and in front of this committee of academics and you know it's this big deal and then I was sort of depressed when it was all over. It wasn't like, yay, I did this big thing and hurrah. It was more like, well, now what? You know? <laughs> so that's, that's human nature. Yourself doctor and that's it, yeah. Yeah, I get the doctor title and yeah. So that, that seems to be human nature, isn't it? That um, we, we do get purpose by having these big projects in front of us. And I've had this thing in front of me for 18 years now. So I'm, I'm, I'm due for a big... Uh, you know, <laughs> I guess let down when when the book comes out. Maybe I don't know, uh, but I do have to get the other two ready. So I'm putting them out one after another. I'm doing one on uh, March 21st, one on June 21st, and one on September 21st. So I do have some little bits of uh, formatting and editing to do because I get to do all that myself as well as a self-publishing author. Um, so yeah, but uh, it, it's I'm I'll, I'll be a busy fellow long enough to to not feel too sad about launch day <laughs> a lot of self-publishers do swear by high tempo releases so they they say that if you keep on pushing out the books at a regular um not regular frequent intervals yeah um you will do better than if you don't uh the only trouble with that is that you have to then reach a point where you you eaten into your your lead and now have to start producing the books as fast as as you put them out which yeah. if it's 18 years then that, that's not gonna fly <laughs> that's not gonna work yeah but I, I have actually written four books in those 18 years so okay. uh, yeah so i've got the trilogy and i have a standalone sequel that i'll probably put out in 2024 um but so i have the slight lead but then i have to start actually writing books again and i promise i won't take 18 years <laughs> <laughs> for the next one but yeah I, I i i i spent time building the world and i made a mythology and languages not like Tolkien. i didn't make a systematic like actual language you could talk to people with but i made i faked it you know you faked it enough so i wasn't that crazy i i at least i i only did enough that it's a fake language you know, sort of so but oh, yeah it's a very old well i don't know if it's old school or not because i'm not sure anyone very many people apart from tolkien and uh maybe i think mar baker is he or barker have, have done that but um yes you you certainly emulated tolkien in that sense <laughs> to some degree um yeah. which is very impressive because i mean i i do talk on my youtube about the whole iceberg thing yep. and how that what's presented as a world in fantasy is often just a facade because that's fine because most people don't have 18 years to build all of the stuff behind it especially <laughs> as it's not going to be seen but yeah. the fact that it's there it gives readers a warm feeling and should should add um and, and sometimes it will materialize on the page in ways that you can't put your finger on but it, it, there's a certain quality there maybe that um maybe i'm lying but may, maybe it's true i like to think that there would be a certain quality there that is born of the fact that all of the the background is is fixed in your mind to a much deeper degree than is on the page. Yeah, yeah, I'd like to think so. I guess it's the equivalent of in the Lord of the Rings films, them building the Shire actually right in, on the hillside, and 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 to some degree it's a set, but it it also looks like a place you'd visit. It doesn't look like a you know a painting in the, in the background or something that uh, a cheap set or something so i i hope that's what it achieves the temptation though was often um to include things that really i shouldn't include because it would interrupt the story you know um and that's that was something i frequently said you know what this adds nothing to the story it, i have to think from a reader's perspective yes i love the fact that i I uh, made up four different religions, but do I really need to explain all this right here? I don't think so. And so I, you know, I had to cut some stuff too, but yeah. If I hadn't read the book and didn't know that it was very good, I would be 
taking comfort from what you're saying right now because a major um i guess fault of of many um writers uh, i guess starting writers is that they put far too much on the page that they're so in love with the the world that they've created yep. and they, they just think they need to educate the the um the reader in all of this history and background and detail um yeah. and that can be awfully um crushing and dull to read because yeah you know even if even if it has been worked out over the course of a lifetime it's still a made-up world that i am not interested in until you make me be interested in it and the only way you can make me be interested in it is to weave that story first and build these characters up yes um, and it's a very fine line to tread because obviously lots of people have different tolerances for the degree of world building some people have an enorm enormously high tolerance for it um but you know, I think George Martin does a, a great job in in this. That he, he strikes a good balance. Yeah. yeah he, he, he lets you sort of he sort of scratches away at things and lets you see through the chink to, to the sort of world behind, and, and gives you the impression that everything has depth and a weight of years behind it, uh, and that you could literally you know put under the spotlight any individual person and and get their um, their backstory and it would all be interesting and and. Again, you can overdo that, and sometimes I feel he does overdo it. But, but most of the time, I think he does it wonderfully and, and adds a great deal to to the books, which is probably why they do so well. I agree. I think he strikes a, a really good balance. He's a good writer to emulate in in that sense. And uh, it, it's interesting though because I do think that with the uh, the disappearing attention spans uh, due to you know, screen storytelling and internet and 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 these things that we all are enslaved to. <laughs> I do feel like there's less tolerance for world building, for description, for exposition than ever before. And as a writer, do you, is that something you agree with first? Are readers less and less tolerant by and large for that sort of thing? They want action and dialogue only. And they get impatient with description and, and exposition. Uh, do you agree with that first? I mean, there's certainly elements of truth in it. Um, I have a fairly low tolerance for world building. And George Martin is one of the few writers who can actually sell it to me in a way that doesn't sort of annoy me. So huh. um, huh. there are many books out there that are very popular with large chunks of the readership that have way too much world building and for me and I say nope I'm not enjoying this I want more mm. of the characters and, and less of the world building so um there certainly is a readership for you know quite heavy world building um, right so like wheel of time uh, for example I don't know if you've read wheel of time or not but it is I, I haven't so yeah but, but and... I did read the first Malazan book and that also seemed to me to be quite a heavy world building thing um, yeah, that's the world that was gamed too. By the way, uh, that was they gamed all that before uh, they wrote the books. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I kind of bounced off it a bit, but I understand that there are enormous um, fandom for it. And uh, oh, I love and, it. I'm I'm a huge fan of Malazan myself. Uh, but but I do agree. It's that it, there's there's a, a sort of an upward hill to climb as a new reader to the series. There's a lot to uh, get to know and you almost have to just sort of let yourself kind of be lost for a while and, and be okay with that. And I think my instincts are not that my instincts are, wait, I have to master all this. So I know what's going on and who goes where and all that. And I, I had to start I think, to learn that. I think the fact that there are so many um, incredibly enthusiastic devotees of Malazan is um a counterweight to the idea that everyone has this sort of um 10 second uh attention span yep. and it's all yep. tiktok and and very short youtubes there, there clearly is this this subset of, of readers who are prepared to put in the the effort and take the time and stay the course and and, and dive deep into these things so yeah. I, I don't think yeah. certainly i don't think you need to worry that um uh that it's the, the world building level is in any any way a problem. Maybe if you'd gone, if you hadn't followed your good instincts and left out those things, um, then maybe you would be in trouble, but certainly not, not as it appears on the page now. And I think there's definitely readership for significantly more world building than, than you put in at the moment. Hopefully you've hit the sweet spot where you'll get the, the maximum interest.
We'll see. Yeah, I, 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 it's very hard to judge yourself and 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 yes, to know. Enormously. Yeah, you know that feeling, I'm sure. But I think you have a point too that obviously I'm not breaking the internet with these videos, but uh, there are obviously people who watch these videos who I, I make hour and a half long discussion videos. And so they don't, I feel like with YouTube, I don't know if you've gotten these messages from YouTube telling you to make shorts or not, but I feel like they're telling me to, to be like a teenager or something. And I, and the shorts, this, they don't fit me very well, you know? I, I've not got explicit messages from YouTube, but it, the, the general message is clear that sort of there's a five minute sweet spot. Um, uh -huh. And that if you go over that, you will gradually lose audience. But the point is, I think that it's quite a fat tail on that distribution and that there is a significant minority who, if you put out something that's sufficiently interesting uh, and well thought out, then will follow you down that that rabbit hole and, and stay with you. So yeah. that's presumably why you have um, more than 10 times the number of followers I do. Uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, well, they just haven't figured out yet that you're there. I think, um, you know, if, 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 honestly, the uh, I, I I shouted about your channel when you started it. I saw, and, I saw that, and I think I got a big rush of, of subscribers that day. So thank you very much. Oh yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. I mean, and that's one of the great things about this community. Honestly, is that people are always helping each other. And there were people who helped me when I started my channel and say, "Hey, this guy sounds sort of sort of like he knows what he's talking about. Check out his channel," you know. Um, but when an author like you says, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to put my hat in the ring and, and, uh, talk about writing. I feel like a lot of people would benefit, uh, from, from paying attention. And so I hope more and more people will. Um, but, but it, a lot of it is kind of superficial too, as you know, uh, you know, making thumbnails that, uh, appeal to, you know, that I got, I used to have the most boring thumbnails on all of YouTube and, and my channel was still growing fine. And then I started, uh, actually my daughter <laughs> educated me on how to make thumbnails. And now I have people tell me at least pretty good thumbnails. Um, and, and you've, you've seen some of my thumbnails. I tend to put people's faces onto characters on book covers yes. and stuff like That's that. Cool. So by the way, do you want to be uh Jorik or Jalen on this uh, thumbnail? <laughs> <laughs> Probably Jalen is closer to the, the characters. So maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, these, these little things like video production, there are people who are way more sophisticated than, than, both of us when it comes to really slick videos and that sort of thing. And, and apparently that's, you know, I, I'll never be that good, but you know. I do no editing. I just push start and stop and that's it. But yes. I have noticed that um, for example, just uh, depends whether you're doing it as a hobby um, or career. So there's a certain point at which it starts, you know, when you get to the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of subscribers where you start to be able to make money at, at that point, it becomes important to, for you to succeed rather yes. than you're just doing it. So um, yeah, there that's was a job. One, yeah. Yeah, there's one famous um, booktuber who invited me to uh, be on his, his thing and, and have an interview some years back. And I said, no, because I was saying no to everything at that point. And it certainly would be a, a bad place to start um but but he moved away from reviewing books because reviewing books doesn't pull in the numbers that you need if you yeah. want to be up there what yeah. you need to do is sort of talk about the fancy genre as a whole in exciting sort of gimmicky interesting ways because right. that's more entertaining that's not a criticism in any sense no because you know obviously people want to watch that that so it's a good thing to make but yeah. um and if it's your bread and butter you know that it, it, it makes sense be, you know, but, but if, if all you're ever going to do is review books, you will, you will hit a, a, a ceiling at some point because yep. the audience for people who want to sit down and listen to 10 minutes or 20 minutes or half an hour on a book is limited. Yeah, unfortunately <laughs> it is, uh, I think. But but there are enough people. There are enough people who are here for the reviews. Uh, I keep saying that I'm going to keep making reviews and have these long form discussions on books. I just had one on a book that you really like, which is the first of the books of Babel by Josiah Bancroft. And Absolutely. I loved it. Send Linus Ends. Uh, really fantastic. The guy can write. Uh, he has a really, really great sense of how to use words. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. SPFBO alumni, he is. 
It's, okay. Yeah. See, there you go. There's a success story right there, and and a testament to how important that contest has become for uh, not just the the authors, but for fans who find books because of that contest. You know, would we know about the books of Babel if, if it hadn't been an SBO FBO uh, finalist? I maybe not. You know. Uh, well, I happen to know, and the answer isn't that no, you wouldn't, and that's one of our sort of the stars of the show, if you like, that uh, Josiah had spent three years uh, in increasingly uh, sort of desperate attempts to get people to read this excellent book. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of that, he had 50 ratings on Goodreads and was basically, um, at, I mean, he's posted about this, so I'm not um, betraying any confidences, and uh, basically at the end of his tether and it said, I'm just going to stop. This, this is obviously not, people don't want to read it. Wow. Uh, and he, he had given up, he said, the SPFBO contest was his last gasp. Um, and after that, it just sort of rock, took off like a rocket. Um, wow. and, and it's sort of, that's a big lesson to me that a book as excellent as that would fail completely despite the very considerable int- and in well-directed efforts of its author. But you have to build a critical mass of readers. If you don't manage yeah. to get a certain number of readers in a small time period, so they can talk about the book among themselves and draw other people in, mm. it's not going to work. Um, and it was the sort of publicity from the SPFBO that, that got that critical mass. And once that critical mass was there, then the book flew on its own merits, but it had to have that push. And that's so hard for self-published authors to get. Oh, yeah. That. I assume that he tried to publish traditionally before he self-published. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and it's no one can say exactly why, but it seems a shame that no publisher would have picked up a book of that quality. It's amazing to me, actually. But it feels like traditional publishing, they're in a bit of a bind, too. I mean, the people there want to put out great stories, presumably. Stories also that sell, but I, I'm sure there are enough people who go into that profession because they love storytelling and they want to put out great stories. But I feel like they're getting increasingly put into this corner by all the changes that have been happening in the publishing world. And they seem, I don't know, maybe I'm being unfair here, but it feels like they're less willing to take a risk on something as different as Sandlin Ascends. I don't know. Would you agree with that? I think they are less willing to take a risk because the role of the sort of the accountancy branch of, of publishers has become more important that I oh. like this is just this is just my my sort of feeling and impression it's by no means to be taken as literal truth yeah but I feel that back in the day editors had more power as individuals and that they could do take more risks and not only that that if they got an author and the author's first book or first trilogy didn't do well they could stick with them and just say, I have faith in this, this this author. I'm going to keep on pushing them to the audience and see what happens. But now, if the numbers associated with the first book are really bad, they have to uh, abandon it or abandon the, the trilogy, right. when, abandon the author when the first trilogy is done because they have to justify everything in an increasingly sort of financial sense um and they lack that freedom that they used to have that's my impression of it and so you know that it's always been a business and they always wanted to make money yeah. but i think that there's less space for um their personal tastes and their desire to champion a particular book it sounds dreadfully like academia <laughs> where more and more and more it's the people with their hands on the purse strings who are making the big decisions about how teaching happens. And you can imagine that those of us who are teaching in the classrooms are a bit tired of that. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it, it's interesting um, and unfortunate, I suppose, uh, because if that is the case, then it, it makes it harder for different and and, and um, original stories to emerge uh, i suppose um, yeah and- i mean i'm not saying it's sort of a binary thing where it's suddenly gone from that to that and there's right. there's now no room i'm just saying there's less room I'm, there's still editors who are doing great jobs of championing their authors yeah. holding the faith with them taking risks on things that they that really speak to them i'm just saying there's less scope for it now 
Yeah. 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 And, and with a much more competitive environment, I suppose, too. Um, uh, yeah. Well, let's just hope that great storytelling is going to come out one way or another, I think. And, and it just has to because it's part of what we are. We are the storytelling creature. And I feel like we need stories. Uh, and that's why I'm so thankful to authors like you who are putting out these wonderful stories that are not just entertaining, but that help people, that help people understand important things. Uh, for me, I mentioned earlier that I, I love what you do with friendship in, in your novels. And uh, it's very deeply affecting. It's very, it's wonderful to experience that along with the characters. Uh, and it makes life make a little more sense, I think, when you engage with a story like that. Uh, so uh, I don't know if, if you're, if you've considered uh, therapy as part of your mission, but <laughs> but there it is. So, well, one of the most surprising things that, that I hear about my books is about the the first trilogy, The Broken Empire, which yeah, you know, is about this this nihilistic teen who um, is a very broken person and does terrible things, and there's lots of violence and, and death in it. And th over the years, I have had literally dozens of, of people email me to say that they were in a very dark place with depression or suicidal thoughts and all of this stuff. And that the books helped them immensely and were somehow cathartic and you know they credit them with being a big part of them stepping out of that. And I would never have predicted that. You know, it, it doesn't um there's no obvious connection there apart from I guess his level of defiance against the uh the situations that, that he finds himself in. Yeah. Um sort of sort of monomania to to just keep on going and, and make things better for himself at least yeah um, uh, and the you know that there was a certain level of catharsis uh, from on my side in, in writing those a certain level of um anger at the world it sort of redirected because of the um the birth of my disabled child so i was sort of um you know how about i have this guy w walk around and break things because um, that's a sort of like, you know, how they have these sort of rage rooms for the people who have had you know, one of my um, readers recently, um, their, their child was killed in an accident. They, they um, oh. um, had to, they were, went to these, these rage rooms and when I touched the walls and, and smashed things just to sort of wow. a, a safety valve on those emotions. This so, event. Yeah. Um, that that is the sort of thing I think maybe the, the role that the, the the broken empire is is performing for um, the people who have who have benefited from it in that way and and so when you say do I see myself as a therapist no I don't but inadvertently some books because they're, they're all essentially mirrors of the human condition if I don't, I don't want to get too pretentious but yeah they can all allow people to look at them and see different things and just sometimes um you know right time right person any book can be a, a considerable help to them. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and in the case of The Broken Empire, I very strongly feel like without any spoilers at all, you need to read the all three books to really get Jorg and to fully appreciate where he is coming from and, and who he is. I, I feel very strongly that the end of that trilogy really affected me deeply. One of the reasons why I loved it one of the first videos I made uh, when I was starting my channel. And I just, it was actually an, an accidentally brilliant idea. <laughs> Once I made a bunch of videos um, saying, here's what I consider to be the best of fantasy. And one of them was on Broken Empire. Uh, and those were my, my very first videos. I just said, why Broken Empire is among the best of fantasy. And that's how I started the whole thing. And it was because I was fascinated by the whole trilogy, but to me, it was the third book that really affected me deeply and made me think, okay, what, what if I were in that position, what would I do? You know? And for me also, because it is your only grimdark trilogy, it also, I think there's a sort of existential element to grimdark that I appreciate. I, I, don't consider myself a grimdark writer, but I do enjoy reading some grimdark because I feel like grimdark is in many ways fantasy's answer to existentialism. Essentially, 
all right, this is a universe where we find ourselves in that has no inherent meaning whatsoever. Life is absurd. What do we do with that? And you have individuals who are just determined to carve meaning for themselves in this environment. Um, and I, I feel like Jorg is one of those. But um, so I, I don't know. Do you agree with that idea that uh, uh, Grimdark is in some way fantasy uh, existentialism? Yes, I guess. Um, there's certainly elements of truth in that. Um, uh -huh. I think so. I mean, you're talking about the, the third book and the first, one of the things I see a lot of people say, well, I read Prince of Thorns and I didn't like it. And right. that's fair enough. You know, a, a book should um, should entertain you in its own right. If it does, uh, I don't really approve of the people who say about certain series, you've just got to keep on reading until you like it. Because, yeah. you know, if you write a book and you put covers around it, then it should be able to do the job on its own. Right. But by the same measure, if you're writing a trilogy and book one gives you everything you need to know about this character, then it's a rather static trilogy. So yeah. the jog of book one isn't the jog of book three. It's a oh. it's a journey. Um, and I would never say, no, you know, you, you only read book one, what do you know? <laughs> because if you read book one, you didn't like it, that's a perfectly valid opinion. Yeah. But you can't, by the same token, you can't say that the, um, you shouldn't, that, that Jorg in book one, that's the whole of his story. That's that's the end. I now know everything about Jorg. Yeah. You know, and part of the reason for making him so young was so he could grow up. Yeah. So yeah. if you say, I now know Jorg, well, you've seen a 14 year old boy, you know, is that the end of the story for, for him? And that's part of the question that the series poses that do the crimes of, that we commit as a very young person yeah. stick with us our entire life and to take it to the absurd limit. If your two year old knifes someone and kills them, you're not going to say that as a 30 year old man, you're responsible for that two year old knifing someone. Right. But as you advance that age, you move into a gray area where, you know, there becomes a discussion and, for me, that sort of 13, 14 um, was a very interesting place to position some of his terrible deeds um, because now we're left with the question, is he written off forever? Um, yeah. Can he grow out of them? Does he want to grow out of them? But it just means that it's a sort of provocative answer to the question. Not everyone falls on the same side of that question, but the hope was that they would read on to find out you know, what their own answer to that question was in the light of more in changing information. Which brings up two more of your hallmarks, I think, as, as a writer. One, the theme of redemption. And I, I love the way you're posing that because I don't ever feel like you're saying this character is redeemable, that character's not. I feel like you're posing a question to the reader and allowing the reader to wrestle with that. And the other hallmark that you made me think of is how much you use flashbacks and how much you play with chronology. And I just love it. It is one of the things that makes your book so clever to me and so compelling because I learned stuff about the character in the present from the events of the past as you revealed them. And you're not a planner, you say. So I don't know how you do that. I don't, I mean, I would have to say, all right, I'm gonna introduce this chunk here and this chunk from the past, I got to move over here. And I, I, you don't do that. You just, it just happens. Well, I mean, there's, there's two sides. There's the sort of the writing mechanic side of things, which if you're writing a single person as a point of view in a book, yeah. then you only have one view on the world. And that can be good for um, getting you very deep into that character, but it can be somewhat limiting because you only have one view on the world, um, which is why many people there say, I'll have three points of view and they can be here and here. But flashbacks or different time, because there's this flashback where you just sort of say, and ah, no, he remembered this stuff. Right. Uh, but there's also what I do, which is a, a thread for sort of four years ago and a thread for now. And if you do that sort of separation in time, you essentially generate two POVs. They're the same person, wow. but they're in different places and different times, getting different views on the things. And there's also an interesting interplay between the two. But the um the other so that's the sort of mechanics of it that it can generate the this extra sort of um perspective on the story but the the sort of thematic thing really or just sort of writing a character is that well it's a theme of mine is memory 
memory is is what we are obviously you know what are you if you take away all your memories you're you're, you're nothing um right. so um to explore a person's memories seems to be a very important part of presenting that person to you hmm. um you know and if you're just writing and this is not a criticism because these are perfectly entertaining books but if you're just writing a sort of straightforward story where you know boy storms a castle to reclaim his right to the the throne and sort of some dragons fly over etc etc that, that's all well and good and you probably don't want to go too deep into that character because there's so much going on that you want to you're spending your pages describing all of the the ongoing events but my single person point of view books tend to be as much about the character as they are about what's going on and so I, I spend a lot of time, you know, exploring them as as well as exploring the world. And a lot of the events that happen, simply to put them under stress, so we can see what happens when they're under stress. You know, you, you understand things better when you break them apart yeah. because you can see the, the mechanics of them. Oh, that's brilliant! I love the way you put that, saying that uh, essentially you have two different POVs, or three, or four, if you have different parts of their lives. Because as as you know, you're a different person. 10 from the person you were 10 years ago in fact most of your cells in your body are, are are weren't there 10 years ago you have totally new cells in all of your organs and skin and everything else and your memories are not what they were 10 years ago even the memories that you think you had 10 years ago and you're holding them still in your wherever they are residing they're not the same because you've been playing with them all these years too so you are a different person you actually do have different POVs there. If you have it, the same person from different points of their lives as POVs. Um, I mean, I'm not a, a neuroscientist, but I, I think memories are, are patterns of electric activity that sort of yep. circulate in, in our brain. So in some sense, they're a bit like the red spot on Jupiter, that they're a persistent pattern. Not, none yeah. of the stuff that's in them is the same stuff that it was you know, in the red spot on Jupiter a hundred years ago. Right had nothing in common with the red spot now, except it's that same pattern that's sort of that vortice. And I think that's what memories are, are like. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I love reading on uh, uh, books about consciousness. Uh, I don't know how much, uh, I mean, your, your area of science is what now you're a physicist or what? what... Well, I did the, my first degree is physics and okay. then, uh, the PhD was a sort of mathematics. So to do with statistics. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the research was all, it falls under the AI umbrella. Um, I don't think we ever use AI sort of in earnest as a, as a term, but it's a sort of layman's um, thing. Um, so yeah, I, I I think most of my thinking about sort of consciousness and thought and memory are just that cogitation that, that I have on my own rather than areas of, of research. Uh -huh. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so I mean, obviously, I keep going on these wonderful asides. But as a, as a physicist, uh, that comes up in your books, too, I think, um, to some degree. Um, there's, there's a little quantum mechanics thrown in. The some, there's some quantum mechanics in there. You do know what you're talking about. Unlike most of us, when we blather on about quantum mechanics, you actually know what you're talking about when you when you're talking about quantum mechanics, right? Can, or can anyone to do to a degree? I've I've certainly studied <laughs> at university. Yeah, but okay. I don't think no, nobody understands um, quantum mechanics. I think that's uh, Richard Feynman said um, famously: if you think you understand what quantum mechanics is about, then you don't understand what quantum mechanics is about. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. All right. Fair I enough. I've dipped my toe into the pool. Huh. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, but yeah, so, well, I feel like I've taken a ton of your time and, and I meant to make this short for you because I know <laughs> you, you have a ton of responsibilities, but I was having so much fun talking with you, but uh, I am aware that you have duties and responsibilities. So, and maybe some writing even to do, but I have enjoyed this tremendously. I'm actually about to put my daughter to bed in 18 minutes. So that will be my next thing on my uh, calendar. Good, good, good. Yes. Well, uh, I wish her sweet dreams and I uh, thank you so much for, for being willing to do this. I know it, it wasn't uh, something that you necessarily relished doing uh, because, and I totally get it. Uh, we're, most of us are introverts, you know, most of us who are book lovers and, and uh, aspiring writers, we are introverts by nature. So this is not something that comes naturally to me either. Um, so I do really appreciate uh, you being willing to come here. And, and I guess 
now this is uh, a, 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 a bit of a warm up. Maybe you'll be doing some more of these type of things in the future. Yes, I, I think I will uh, do some more and hopefully try to avoid saying the same damn thing over and over again. <laughs> oh, no, you, you'll have to answer the same question a million times, I'm sure. <laughs> but but uh, yes, th this has been um, far less terrible than, than I was led to believe. That's good. <laughs> I'm taking that as a tremendous compliment. And uh, I uh, am just delighted. And I'm sure that my viewers will be very happy to have heard from you. Uh, so everybody, please, uh, if you haven't yet, uh, check out Mark Lawrence's books. They are tremendous. They are life-changing. They're among my very favorites. They are among the best of fantasy. And also check out his channel. Uh, it's called Mark Lawrence. And uh, there's lots of wonderful writing advice there, uh, stuff about uh, your particular writing journey, Mark, uh, which I think is really helpful uh, it gives people hope, actually, to hear stories like that. Um, so some wonderful videos on that and uh, various types of content there that I think would be really beneficial for the book lovers and any aspiring writers. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. And everybody, until next time. <laughs>